Hi, thank you for tuning in. Uh, my name is Jake Lillian. I'm an attorney here at NCRC, and I am the manager of NCRC's compliance program. I am very happy to welcome you all to the first ever NCRC conference panel on LGBTQ issues. Uh, we know that there are a lot of people within our community of advocates who are working on LGBTQ issues every day. A survey of NCRC's member organizations showed that over 100 of them listed the LGBTQ population as one of their areas of focus. And the NCRC staff itself contains lots of queer employees and allies. A lot of you are probably familiar with a colleague of mine named Karen Shakira Kali. Uh, she is NCRC's senior program manager for special initiatives. Pretty much everybody knows Karen. Uh, Karen and I have been very eager for some time now to have a large platform like this conference where we could host a discussion about LGBTQ equality. And so we organized this panel together and we chose the topic of lending. And we chose lending as the topic because we found that when people talk about LGBTQ equality, they almost always talk in terms of legal rights, uh, such as can same-sex couples get married and adopt? Can trans youth legally access gender-affirming medical care? Uh, can queer people ser serve openly in the military? Etc. And those are all hugely important issues, but equality isn't just about legal rights. Uh, to be blunt, equality is also about money. Uh, there's a massive racial wealth gap in this country, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, there's also a significant wealth gap between LGBTQ Americans and their straight cisgender counterparts. And for anyone who hasn't heard the term cisgender before, it just means someone who is not trans. The racial wealth gap and the LGBTQ wealth gap mean that if you're a queer person of color, then you are especially likely to be at a huge financial disadvantage. There are a multitude of reasons for why this LGBTQ wealth gap exists, and our panelists will be discussing them during the session. But spoiler alert, one of the reasons is access to credit. Uh, more and more evidence has been emerging showing that LGBTQ people are less likely to receive a loan when they need one. And when they do receive loans, they're more likely to receive loans with high interest rates and high fees. So in this panel, we're going to discuss why this wealth gap persists and what lenders can do to try to ensure that their practices are as equitable as possible. Uh, before I introduce our speakers though, let me take a quick minute for a plug. Uh, NCRC has a community of practice for LGBTQ issues, uh, which is a network that Karen and I founded for advocates who focus on these issues in our work, uh, or just people who are passionate about these issues. Uh, it's a way for us to share knowledge and network and get the latest updates on what's happening in the community. There is no fee to join, and you don't have to be an NCRC member. Uh, we host quarterly Zoom meetings with guest speakers, and we have webinars. You'll be receiving an email about joining the community of practice. And if you're already a member, then please just ignore it. So with that out of the way, uh, let me introduce our panel of speakers. Our first panelist is economics professor Lee Badgett of the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, she is also a distinguished scholar at UCLA's Williams Institute which is an invaluable resource for data on sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, she's also one of the Williams Institute's co-founders, and she is, an auth she is the author of a book titled The Case for LGBTQ Economic Equality, Why Fair and Equal Treatment Benefits Us All. Our second speaker will be Juan Carlos Izaguirre, who is a senior financial sector expert on financial inclusion and consumer protection issues. He is currently leading the LGBT employee group at the World Bank, and the World Bank is doing some fascinating work uh, promoting LGBTQ issues around the globe. Our third speaker is Kay Kenneth Davis, who is better known as the trans capitalist. He is a financial consultant who specializes in helping trans clients manage the unique economic challenges that they face. And he is the author of a financial workbook titled the most important money talk your parents never gave you. Last but not least, we have NCRC's own Jason Richardson, who is the director of research. 
He and Karen co-authored a study last year on same-sex couples in mortgage lending. Uh, he's here to, to explain their findings, uh, which showed that same-sex couples do not, on average, receive the same quality of lending products that different sex couples do. Uh, so without f any further ado, let's go on to the panel. Uh, Professor Badgett, you are our first guest speaker at a community of practice meeting. And you really summed up very nicely where various groups within the LGBTQ community stack up economically. And we were hoping you could give us some more insight into that topic. Welcome. Great, thank you so much. Thanks Jake and Karen for organizing this. I'm, uh, I'm honored to, to be invited to, to speak to you at this amazing conference. Um, so I'm going to start us off this, this larger conversation by thinking about income. If we're thinking about wealth, then most of the time we're also thinking about income because that's how uh, most people build wealth is through uh, the money that they bring in, almost always through uh, through jobs. Um, and uh, income is an important measure for lots of other reasons. It affects our health uh, and other kinds of well-being, and um, it it matters for um, uh, for where we live. Uh, it has many different uh, effects on on our on our daily lives. And so I'm going to talk about. Um, this from a couple different perspectives of two reports that I, if I can figure out how to do it, I will put this in the comments after I'm done. Uh, but two recent studies that have come out on this issue. One is the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine came out in the fall with a big report on the well-being of sexual and gender diverse populations, including LGBT people, uh, LGBT plus people. And, uh, uh, I participated in writing a long chapter on uh, economic well-being. So you, if you want like real numbers, <laughs> that's a great place to find them. And then my uh, colleagues, uh, Kit Carpenter and Dario Sansone, and I just came out with a piece called LGBTQ Economics, which also has some very up-to-date figures. Um, but I'm going to talk very generally about this. Um, and I want to hit on two key themes. One is a theme of inequality, of economic inequality. And Jake has definitely uh, foreshadowed this. Um, and this is important, I think, uh, to mention off the bat, we have lots of stereotypes that also apply sometimes to uh, the economic well-being of LGBT people, but we're gonna really focus on a very different picture which shows uh, inequality uh, in the wrong direction for LGBT people. Um, and then secondly, just to at least hint at what some of the dynamics are that are going to shape that, what that inequality looks like. And, and there I'm thinking about bias, um, and prejudice uh, in, in different kinds of contexts, as well as adaptations to that that people might actually mean. But let's start with the with the uh, the economic status of LGBT people measured in terms of income. Um, there there are uh, many studies that have looked at this in the United States and actually around the world, and they have. Um, when looking at sexual orientation differences, which is the main thing we know about, the main thing we have uh, pretty, pretty good emerging data sets on, um, we see two very clear patterns. One is for men, um, and we really distinguish uh, cisgender people from, um, from transgender people, unfortunately, and then there's a very different pattern for women. Let's start with the pattern for men. So if we compare, if we compare the earnings of gay and bisexual men to those of heterosexual men, we find uh, that actually the gay and bisexual men earn less than do heterosexual men. Even after we control for all the things that matter for incomes, like how old people are and how much experience they have, how much education they have, where they live in the country, um, whether they're married or not, what their race is, um, those, uh, those factors taken into account, still we see this big gap between gay and bisexual men and heterosexual men. Uh, a study that looked at a whole bunch of different studies altogether a few years back found that that gap was about 11%. So gay and bisexual men earn about 11% less than, uh, than comparably qualified and uh, uh, heterosexual men with comparable characteristics. So that is, um, that is a gap that's very consistent and we have seen this actually in different parts of the world. I will just mention that there have been a few studies that suggest that maybe that gap is decreasing a little bit uh, over time. That's actually very hard to follow. Uh, that I'm happy to talk about data in the q and I don't wanna go into too many details, but I will just say we have one data set where we can actually follow a subgroup 
of LGBT, of LGB people over time, and that's the American Community Survey. We can we have that going back 20 years or more, but we also uh, and we can see people who are in same sex couples. Actually, we know from other research that people in same sex couples mostly are uh, gay or lesbian identified. Uh, bisexual people, by and large, um, are in different sex couples. But anyway, so it does uh, it, it does capture only a subgroup of people in couples. Um, and when we look at the same kind of question, what do the earnings of, uh, of men in same-sex couples look like compared to men in different sex couples over time, we actually do not see a drop in that gap. That gap has, uh, has, been, uh, has gone up and down over time, but it has stayed pretty stable and it is still negative even now. So, uh, so we have a, a persistent, pervasive uh, wage gap for, for gay and bisexual men. What about for women? It's a little bit complicated because uh, what we actually see when we compare lesbian and bisexual women to heterosexual women is that by and large, the lesbian and bisexual women earn more than the heterosexual women do. And that's for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, heterosexual women um, tend to uh, have very different patterns of labor force participation than lesbian and bisexual women do. They don't work as many weeks in the year. They don't work as many hours. They don't work. They haven't worked as many years. Um, it's very hard in research to see those differences. So they kind of get folded into that, uh, what looks like a, an advantage for lesbian and bisexual women. Some people have even called it that. Um, but in fact, we think what it, what it, what it is, is just uh, mainly lesbian and bisexual women having more experience for which they, we think they probably should be paid more. Um, and uh, someday maybe we'll have the data where we can take that directly into account. Interestingly, uh, if when we do the same thing that we did for men, when we looked at women in same sex couples and looked to see how the gap uh, compared, the positive gap compared to uh, women in different sex couples changed over time, that gap has almost completely disappeared. So there is almost no remaining wage advantage, at least in that particular data set for uh, women and same sex couples. So things are happening. We're still trying to figure it all out, but, uh, but things are changing, but not obviously for the better for either gay and bisexual men or uh, lesbian and gay women. Um, so um, we do have a little tiny bit of good data on transgender people in the United States. There's really only one good study where we can look at these economic outcomes um, for transgender people and compare them to cisgender people. That's a, a, a public health data set called the Behavior Risk Factor Surveillance System. Um, and what we see there is that um, uh, gay and bisexual people, uh, sorry, transgender people, um, have much lower household incomes than do uh, similarly situated uh, cisgender people. So there's a very clear and large, it's, it's something on the order of, depending on which group of transgender people, 10 to 15% lower household incomes overall. And let me just say, you know, these, uh, these studies of income are in a sense just fancy ways of comparing people at the average, uh, looking at average differences. If we focus just for a second, on people at the very low income end of the spectrum, people who are living below the poverty line, we actually see um, some, some very clear and striking patterns. Lesbian and gay people uh, actually don't do any better, but they also don't do obviously, uh, they're not obviously worse off with regard to poverty than heterosexual men and women. However, transgender people and bisexual people uh, in several studies have been shown to have significantly higher risks of poverty uh, than, uh, than uh, cisgender people um, and uh, higher rates than, than lesbian and gay people uh, for bisexual people. Um, so, uh, so the most recent study that I did with some colleagues at the Williams Institute, we found that transgender people had a rate of poverty of about 29%, which is just shockingly, shockingly high. Um, so, so there are large discrepancies in, in uh, earnings and, and access to income for, uh, for LGBT people across the board. And that looks particularly um, um, damaging and, and harsh for, for low income people who are bisexual or transgender. Let me just add a couple of layers of intersectionality to this. Uh, one uh, I, I sort of hinted a little bit at with regard to gender, um, thinking about cisgender women, um, whether they're heterosexual or lesbian or bisexual, they all earn less 
than cisgender men do, whether they're gay or uh, or straight men. So there's definitely the same kind of gender gap that we see more broadly in our economy. We see there, and as I said earlier, we see that for transgender people too. If we layered on top of this differences across race and ethnicity, uh, we would see that uh, that there are very different patterns of income, and, and I won't have time to talk about poverty, but very different patterns for income and poverty for uh, people of color who are LGBTQ. Um, white people in general, white LGB people, uh, tend to earn more than um, uh, either black or uh, Latino or Latinx uh, LGBT people. Um, when we look at um, black and Latinx LGBT people, in most of the studies that we've got, it also looks like they earn less than heterosexual black and Latinx people. So, uh, so there are definitely different uh, forces kind of um, shaping the economic experiences of, of LGBT people that are related to their, their sex, their gender, and, uh, and their race and ethnicity. Uh, last, let me just say, I don't have, uh, I'm running out of time, but, uh, but I will just say that uh, that we do have very good evidence uh, from an entirely different kind of, sur of research approach that suggests that there is bias and discrimination uh, that is shaping some of these patterns for uh, for LGBT people, and uh, I'm happy to talk about that uh, more in the um, you know, in the Q and A. But uh, uh, I will just say you will hear uh, something about uh, credit discrimination. All these patterns about income are very much likely behind the fact that LGBT people are significantly less likely to own homes. Um, so that is an important marker of wealth that I know is one that's uh, very important to the NCRC folks. So I will stop there and look forward to the conversation and I will post those links now. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for the invitation um, to the NCRC. I'm very glad to talk about a bit of the work that the World Bank has been doing on the topic of uh, fair finance, responsible finance, and how this is connecting actually with uh, getting more information around the LGBT population. So uh, first, I will just briefly tell you that the World Bank Group has several units that have some level of engagement with issues related to LGBT community. On the one hand, we have a responsible financial access team that is supporting the implementation of good practices for financial consumer protection in a range of emerging markets. These good practices align with the OECD principles for financial consumer protection, and both include the importance of fair treatment of consumers, especially vulnerable consumers and minorities, including sexual orientation and gender identity minorities, which are called out explicitly in these documents. The World Bank Group also has a sexual orientation and gender identity, or SOGI, team that is aiming to generate data, build knowledge and evidence on LGBT population in a range of World Bank operations. And this team, for example, have has uh, carried out important surveys on the economic situation and experiences of LGBT population in a few emerging countries to better understand the challenges and their experiences on a range of economic issues, including in a couple of countries on experiences with financial sector um, access and usage. Our private sector focused institution, the Inter International Finance Corporation, IFC, has also promoted responsible finance by financial institutions. It has just recently started to expand their initial work on gender to also include a SOGI, sexual orientation and gender identity angle. This is just recent from, from last year. Last but not least, the Consultative Group to Assist the Poor, or CGAP, is a financial inclusion think tank housed at the World Bank and supported by over 30 organizations that promote responsible financial inclusion. And we are working with authorities financial institutions, funders, standard setters, and other stakeholders to raise the importance of adding the LGBT community in part of our discourse. Recently, for example, we published a paper on COVID-19 uh, uh, challenges, especially in the informal workers segment, and we called out the challenges of the LGBT community, and we asked uh, authorities to do more on this point so that uh, this population segment would also receive support in such uh, challenging situations. Uh, I, I would now like to, to highlight that on the topic of responsible finance and consumer protection, 
more recent years, there has been an important evolution globally. Countries like UK, Australia, India, Peru, Ghana, Philippines, Malaysia are now embracing the concept of consumer protection focused on customer outcomes. This means that regulators, providers, shall shift their mindset uh, from more traditional compliance with strict rules to focus on actual outcomes or results attained by consumers when they engage with financial institutions. An outcomes-based approach deploys a variety of tools to help authorities and providers better understand their customers' needs and incentivize providers to address them. This means putting customers at the center, looking at what results consumers are obtaining when they engage with, uh, with financial services providers. By putting customers at the center, there is a much greater focus on understanding the experiences and challenges of different consumer segments, and especially vulnerable consumer segments like the LGBT population. However, I have to say that based on, on our initial desk and field research, segmented data is unfortunately not adequately collected, let alone analyzed. And this overall in different types of segmentation criteria, but of course, especially on SOGI. At the same time, we have discovered that there is much more interest and appetite from both authorities and financial institutions to embrace this type of outcome-based or customer-centric consumer protection approaches and therefore to work on better gathering data about consumers, including segmented data. Based on our conversations with uh, providers and authorities, there is an increasing understanding that a consumer who is protected and finds value from the use of financial services is more likely to be able to capture opportunities and build resilience against shocks and economic risks. And it's started to be understand, uh, understood that this is also good for businesses in the long run. In terms of main outcomes, we're talking about choice, which entails that providers must give a range of choices of products for all types of clients in the same manner, equitably. Voice, which entails appropriately listening and gathering information from consumers throughout their journey of engagement with a provider. Safety and security, which entails protecting the privacy of information of clients, including sensitive data, and the clients do not lose their money. Suitability and appropriateness, which relates to being offered products that suit the characteristics of a consumer or a household. Fair treatment, which entails ensuring non-discrimination and equal and respectful treatment. And meets purpose, which entails that a financial product does what it's supposed to do to address consumer needs. We believe that it is beneficial for all financial institutions to be customer-centric, to capture data. Now, a key way to be customer-centric is to gather consumer insights at all the stages of the product life cycle. And this includes collecting key demographic information that helps segmenting and clustering consumers. And we have done quite some, some more work on this point on how uh, providers can be more customer-centric. And we have seen some interesting examples at three different levels. Learning from customers, designing solutions, and organizing for delivery. In learning from customers, a key point is collecting segmented data. And an interesting example is we, we have seen that the State Bank of Pakistan is requesting financial institutions to provide, to provide aggregated data on customers and third-party agents or intermediaries that are disaggregated by gender. This means not only men and women, but also third option for transgender and non-binary population segments. So Pakistan is doing this, uh, and they are starting to do more evaluation and analysis around this data, which is the second point, analyzing data based on the information collected from consumers, which may include, for example, building personas or profiles of customer segments based on that segmented data. The third important point around learning from customers is generating insight. And for example, CIGAP just a few months ago recently conducted consumer research to better understand different groups of consumers active in formal, in informal online commerce markets. As part of this research, we did in-depth interviews and small group discussions with different types of tools to better understand characteristics of different types of customers. We talked with a 29-year-old transgender woman 
who has lived her entire life in Multan, Pakistan, and runs an online business. She shared many stories of how being a trans woman had resulted in restrictions of her movement, removal from public spaces, and harassment by strangers. And thankfully, that she has support from her family. Her struggles to finish university and being hired led her to be a self-entrepreneur that buys and sells goats online. She shared that she relies on her brother and cousin to escort her in public for her safety and takes pains to avoid social contact with people she doesn't know and trust. This has some implications of how she handles her payments. She doesn't have a bank account because she feels this is only for the most affluent and she's not comfortable about the type of information that will be shared about her or what could be done with that information. She instead uses a mobile money account that facilitates money transfers, use of ATMs, and that gives her uh, much more convenient in using and talking with agents and other type of more direct uh, engagement we provide. So this is just an example of how financial institutions can really understand better the type of experiences of consumer segments and how similar type of this type of interviews has done by a few other financial institutions also looking at specific segments of LGBT population, which is some important recent type of development. Another important element on customer centricity is designing solutions based on consumer insights. Here, for example, we have seen that in Peru, Uganda, and other emerging countries, uh, transgender population have had uh, several issues around fair treatment. And in many cases, their main point of contact have been consumer associations, who have in turn raised complaints to consumer organizations, to, sorry, consumer protection agencies, or other state authorities. And in cases such as in Peru, uh, the General Consumer Protection Agency actually managed to persuade a financial institution in uh, recognizing their mistreatment to LGBT population. Uh, also, in one specific case, they managed to persuade and to actually mandate a financial institution to recognize a same-sex civil union uh, based on a foreign marriage certificate, even when marriage is not legal in Peru. But they uh, stated that not recognizing that marriage was a discrimination uh, action. So the actual Consumer Protection Agency did make a change and published the, the statement, the decision, so that this uh, action would encourage other financial institutions to follow the same type of uh, action that is non-discriminatory. We're also seeing actually that some providers, such as uh, some car providers, are now allowing the user to indicate their preferred name on the front of their card, debit card or credit card. This is really uh, an interesting case to address some problems that uh, especially transgender, non-binary uh, populations have had in terms of uh, non, uh, in terms of problems of identification uh, and uh, denying some services because the consumer officer or financial institution uh, didn't want to recognize the gender identity of their client. So now these uh, will be better addressed by allowing consumers to actually indicate their preferred name in cards. The final point is organizing for delivery, important also for customer centricity. This includes, for example, allowing for male, female, and non-binary uh, loan officers, intermediaries, and their offer financial products. So they can help consumers be more comfortable when using financial services. And we have heard already some cases in South Asia where agents who are transgender or non-binary have been quite successful in maintaining longer term financial relationships with clients uh, by a kind of having a good report with uh, different segments of clients uh, and being much more uh, friendly and, and really being successful in their engagement. So this type of uh, openness to having uh, customer facing staff and intermediaries that are non-binary have been welcomed by a financial institution by seeing the success uh, rates of good uh, long-standing loyal relationships 
uh, with customers. So these are just a few examples of actions that have been done recently. And I'll be happy to share uh, also on the chat uh, some uh, resources around these uh, and other uh, research that we have done in the world. Thank you. All right, our next speaker will be Kay Kenneth Davis. Sorry about that. So I wanted to start off with a story about a young person named Joe. Now Joe has straight A's, is from a loving family, but then actually realizes that they are transgender. And this family disagrees with Joe. So now Joe is kicked out and disowned. And now you're probably thinking, what choices can Joe make, especially being transgender within this world? So the options are either the streets where Joe can face being homeless, where even 68% of homeless youth are homeless due to the fact that they were kicked out and disowned as well. So then there's the other option of college. So let's say Joe chose college and Joe actually graduates because college was actually a place for them to have shelter and continuous food and do not care about what major they're in, but just to get something to survive. But when Joe graduates, Joe incurs, especially for LGBT people, 50% more college debt than the average person. So if Joe has all this debt looming over their head. They're thinking of what sources of income can they actually do? But we need to understand that one, they don't have these sources of income because they can't go to their families because their families do not own them anymore. Or understanding that Joe has these two statistics weighing over their head of one, that especially since Joe is a person of color, that the um, unemployment rate is four times the national average higher for transgender people. And then understanding that the average salary for a transgender person, especially a transgender person of color, it's only 10,000 a year. Who can live or even survive on that? But just understanding that Joe is looking for a job, people have to understand that within your transitioning, you are going to look a certain way. And as they are applying for the job, they cannot hide who they are compared to their LGB um, counterparts who they don't have to out themselves anymore that they can able to find their dream job. But according to Joe, being transgender, they have to go to HR. And they have, and people have to understand that HR has default white cisgender heteronormity spaces of how they should appear, how they should look, and how they should act within these within these work environments. But understanding that if Joe outs themselves, they are putting themselves within a toxic place where it can turn toxic for their work environment, but also face discrimination from their colleagues. And now Joe has another choice to face to either leave this job or accept it because you have to understand there are rarely any transgender people of color in power positions within these corporations. Transgender people are left to take lower salaries or they actually have to work hourly wages. And even if they receive that job and that salary, it is very low. So Joe has another decision to understand that if they leave this job, they are going to have to fight and fend for themselves and work in a gig economy. So gig economy can actually be something of use where they can help build a side hustle and get their entrepreneurship. But then when it comes to lending and getting a loan, they are often turned away because they have unstable, unstable income. And you have to understand that even if they did take this job and even trying to get life insurance as another source of income, that they are discriminated against there as well because they're outing themselves due to medical and psychological discrimination within that as well. So even if they counted themselves as bipolar or had a suicide attempt, that is counted against them even gaining life insurance and has them as another risk. But even understanding the transitional expenses are always higher than their cisgender counterparts, that they have the higher costs in insurance and healthcare. And we can't even start on family planning or even surrogacy because insurance companies do not cover them. Most transgender people are covered under Medicaid, which barely covers their transitional expenses. Anything higher than that, such for family planning, has to come out of pocket. And even with their transgender expenses of going to life 
surgery, gender affirming surgery. We actually call that life saving gender a surgery within the community because this is more than a necessity and not looking to appear as a cosmic or a cosmetic place for these transgender people. And I want to understand, I want you to understand also if they have to find another source of income, the transgender community lies heavily on credit cards because their financial literacy rate is very low. They do not understand the rule of financial literacy or even understanding that there's actually rules to money. But even starting off their credit journey, they are penalized from changing their name and other ID documents, and they start off with a lower credit score than their average counterparts, which is horrible because when they depend on their credit cards, because their transitional costs probably for their life-saving surgery ranges anywhere from 8K to 10K, where is it coming out of their pockets? It's coming out of themselves, and they can't afford these, so they depend on credit cards but they don't understand the concept of interest and also do not understand overdraft fees from their own self. Because at the end of the day, transgender people are trying to survive. They're trying to keep their head above water and they're already faced with so many discriminations when it comes to the simple solutions that people may think that they can have. Especially when I just talked about of trying to find a job and the discrimination within that workplace they can't go. So they try to do entrepreneurship and when it's time to get a business loan, they are at risk of lending because they do not have the stable income that their counterparts actually do. So even if, and to even look for the future, you have to understand that transgender people's future is only a month or two months out in advance because they are struggling to pay their current bills that they have because due to not finding a stable income that the society or even this capitalistic world would be able to offer them. And I want you to understand that even having a savings account, they do not have them. They use them as a second checking account. They have lower rates of looking into IRAs, individual retirement accounts, because they are just looking to survive. And then even understanding that they don't even have home ownership. So I always ask the question, as Joe is going through this path, what can Joe do? And this is very hard because these are the obstacles that Joe has to face. Now, I want to put a face to these numbers that you are looking at, even with the data for transgender people are actually low. I want you to understand that I am Joe. My clients are Joe. And we are fighting to get a piece of the American pie or the American dream. But we are unable to do so with all these discrimination and redlining processes that are within place with this systematic oppression of capitalism. So how can, so I always wanna ask you the question, how can we survive within? Thank you. Hi everybody, thank you, Jake. My name is Jason Richardson. I'm the director of research for the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. And today I'm going to share a, a few screen, a few slides from a report that Karen uh, Shakira Kali and I did uh, last year on same sex couples and mortgage lending. And we should be sharing now. There we go. Perfect. All right. Um, this report actually we're going to uh, Karen's in the chat right now, and I think she's going to drop in some uh, some background on the report that I'm going to talk about, including some uh, some um, notifications that, that we've got today from uh, the, from the uh, from Congress that, that uh, we were mentioned in a memo that was issued today by the Financial Services Committee and we were mentioned on the floor as well. Um, so let's take a look at this. What when Karen and I started working on this report, we realized that during the literature scan, there was very little out there right now on the um, on how same sex couples were encountering the mortgage market. There were a couple of small reports, but the nature of mortgage data uh, prior to 2018 made it very difficult to really use the largest uh, mortgage data set, which is the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data. However, in 2018, some interesting new variables were added. To, the, to that data set, including details on things like loan costs, interest rates, closing fees, and things like that. And 
that kind of gave us a, 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 a pathway we felt to take a look at same sex couples and see how they were performing in the, in the market differently than different sex couples. So the Humda data set comes out every year and it has about 12 to 14 million records in it. These are all the about 88% of mortgage applications that are uh, filed every year in the United States. Uh, we cut that down to uh, a data set of 6.5 million home purchase loans for owner occupied properties in 2018. Uh, out of those uh, loans, about 3 million of them included both an applicant and a co-applicant where both of them had indicated their gender on the, on the loan application. So you, you understand a lot of, you know, if you apply for a mortgage and there is no co-applicant, you know, then obviously they're not there. And not every applicant fills out the demographic data. But with 3 million loans to look at, we were pretty happy with the size of the data set. About 5% of those cases, the gender of the applicant and the co-applicant was identical, either male or female for both. And we realize that that's pretty close to the 4.5% of the general population that identifies as LGBTQ+. So we're pretty happy with um, the, you know, the representation, at least, uh, of the same-sex couples in the data set. And so we just wanted to do kind of a, a descriptive analysis here just to understand a little bit more about this data before we really d dived into it and the first thing we noticed was that different sex couples are typically much older than same-sex couples uh, we're looking at those under the age of 35 and 35 to 54 is about the prime home buying years for most people so under 35 years of age uh, only 37 percent of different sex couples that were purchasing a home were under the age of 35, compared to 41% of uh, same-sex female couples and 49% of same-sex male couples. Um, we also took a look at the race of the applicant, uh, race or ethnicity of the applicant for for uh, for three all three different categories, and this was also interesting. Different sex couples are much whiter than same-sex couples with 73% of different sex couples on home purchase loans, uh, both applicants were, were uh, or the, uh, the applicant was white, 10% uh, Hispanic, 4% black, and just 6% Asian American or Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. Meanwhile, for same-sex male couples and same-sex female couples, it was a very different story. Just 59% of those home buyers were white. And finally, we also looked at their income within a kind of a broad context. The, the mortgage data measures low or moderate income, which means the uh, income of the borrower is 80% or less of the median income for the place that they're uh, living in. Middle or upper income borrowers are anything, that may, anything above that 80%. And here we also notice some variations, in particular, same-sex female couples you can see that they, uh, they are much more likely to be a low or moderate income borrower than a middle or upper income borrower, while same-sex male couples and different sex, male, uh, different sex couples were generally uh, pretty similar. Um, so just a few things that we were able to take from this kind of descriptive analysis that we did. Uh, same-sex couples are generally denied for a loan more often. They pay higher interest rates. And in particular, same-sex males play high, pay higher closing cost, and we're not really sure why. Um, but that's what we found. So uh, there's a lot of complications to this. This is a relatively simple descriptive analysis where we've pulled uh, the data for you know three million uh, loans that we wanted to look at, and we've just looked at at uh, you know differences between three pretty broad categories. Uh, I'd like to think that follow-on work here would include a much more rigorous analysis, uh, especially of confounding variables such as age, race, income. Um, we, we see there's a lot of overlap between same-sex couples and a lot of other categories that we already know suffer pretty extreme uh, discrimination in the mortgage market, but teasing out how much of that is related to uh, the same-sex status would be um, would be ideal, I think. And also, we're hopeful that at some point in time, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, which manages the Humda program, will add questions on sexual orientation and transgender status to the um, 
to the Humda data. We think that that would be uh, would make it much more useful. Um, let me see here. So that was what we did, and we're very happy with this report. I'd like to you know answer any questions if anybody has any. Just put them in the chat. But uh, and uh, also the, click on the links that I think uh, Karen has been posting to see more about how this work is being used uh, by the um, House Financial Services Committee. Thank you very much. All right, uh, so this brings us to the question and answer period. Uh, we got some good questions from the audience. Uh, the first one I'm going to pose to anyone who wants to answer is, in addressing the needs of vulnerable populations such as LGBTQIA, what measures do you think lending institutions should take to train their staff about bias? Well, I'll jump in. Um, so, so it, in my so for ten years or so, I've been mostly focused on mortgage data. So, I'm going to confine you know just my comments to that. And and prior to that, I, I was a mortgage originator for some time as well. And and uh, mortgage lending is it's a it, you have a combination of of factors that are all kind of stacked against same sex applicants. I think in a lot of ways. Um, there, there are uh, systemic issues built into the mortgage process of, of that favors older applicants with higher income, and that often breaks down on race and class lines, and, and in part because same-sex couples appear to be much more likely, at least the ones in the home buying space, appear, appear to be much more likely to also tick these other boxes that we know in, encounter um, you know, systemic discrimination. That that's a that's a systemic issue that has to be addressed, and 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 you are already uh, you know advocating on several fronts for for things to fix that. Um, but I think I think what you're you're talking about more is going to be the 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 in the the personal aspect of it, the parts of the mortgage process that are not automated that have to do with how mortgages are marketed and sold, and offered to people and discussed. And I th I think that that's uh, where we need to see uh, more action and more attention. Anyone else have any thoughts or should I move on to the next question? Well, I mean, I, I would say uh, there, there are different things that you can say. I mean, one of the uh, findings that we had in the National Academy's report was that we don't have a lot of great interventions designed to change, uh, to change um, uh, people's reaction to LGBT people in different kinds of settings. So, so we do need some more research there, I think. But I mean, but the, but there are a lot of things that you can do uh, in terms of educating people about uh, about the fact that discrimination is illegal, um, and uh, in I think there are at least some states that have explicit state laws. Um, I'm not as aware of kind of the the extent of, of federal laws in these issues, but certainly the the Bostock decision, which somebody has asked about in the comments, you know, kind of conclusively says discrimination against LGBT people is sex discrimination. That is illegal. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so we, um, uh, so pe people need to understand that. Um, I think also thinking through um, where the different kinds of situations are that might, um, that might influence uh, people's reactions to say a same sex couple um, are important to, to know more about. There's a little bit of research on this that shows that, uh, um, that uh, people applying for, for uh, mortgages in a more experimental setting actually are treated very differently from uh, um, non-LGBT people and particularly uh, non-LGBT white people. Uh, so uh, so there, there are just lots of different kinds of layers that I think kind of having some, at least to start with, in the absence of knowing lots of different ways of, of doing this kind of work, at least explaining the policy, um, pointing out the problem, um, and engaging people in conversations uh, about how something can, can be done about that, I think, is a way to start. Jake, I would also uh, add on, on these excellent comments. Uh, the, uh, on bias, I think we always 
need to think of pause and think of how I could be the source of the bias and how bias can manifest. And this goes both into personal issues, you no, know, in terms of thinking about unconscious bias, for example, whether there is something in me that I haven't noticed and therefore I haven't reflected even upon on that. But I need I just need to pause, think, reflect, and then see whether I have acted on that type of initial bias. Same with personal traits should be done from a from a technical algorithm and methodological sense. For example, in SIGA, we did an analysis with, and this is only female and male because we couldn't gather as much information on, on, on non-binary, but we did analysis of digital credit in Tanzania to see whether there was any, any potential bias in digital credit algorithms. And we saw that even though women and men were as good payers, then access to credit was 20 point difference. Right? So much more credit given to men, 20 more points to men than to women. For us, that finding told us that the algorithm had some level of bias embedded. So what we recommended the authorities was you need to have a better governance framework to analyze the results of those credit screening and credit scoring processes to see what type of bias is embedded in your processes. Then by looking at the results, so what type of training within institutions to be able to look at the results of the credit decisions analyze the credit scoring and screening processes, and then see what changes need to be made if you see results that are really biased. Okay, uh, we've got a question for Jason. Uh, is the data available by geographic area of the country or by urban versus rural? So the, the data does have, uh, you know, it does narrow down the location to the census track. Uh, in this report, we didn't dive into that very much, but I, th I think it'd be really interesting to to look at the data that way, you know, especially in comparison with with literature on things like uh, you know same sex couples by metro area or by county or or neighborhood even, and see if if there's any interesting patterns. Um, it, it's part of the follow on work that I think that that um, that would be really great to uh, to get started on. Uh, you know, there's another. another there was another okay. question here, I think, about uh, the SOGI data Yes. And, and what would be the process to start it. The Consumer Finance Protection Bureau oversees the Home Mortgage uh, Disclosure Act data set. So it would be uh, probably a rulemaking process that they would have to initiate. Um, we're working with them right now on a similar process for the implementation of Section 1071 of Dodd-Frank, which will collect business loan data. Um, so, you know, ho hopefully this is something that we can we can start, at, you know, agitating for as well. OK, uh, our next question is, how do we move past the narrative of the gay wealth myth? It's clearly a barrier, especially in the financial services industry. How do we scale up some of the interventions mentioned? I know you've written about this. Lee. Yeah, I wrote a book about it 20 years ago, and it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's obviously not simply a matter of having good data, but I think, uh, you know, how do you get rid of a, of a myth like that? It's very hard. And I will say one thing is you might have noticed I did not actually mention that myth. Um, and one reason is that when you repeat things uh, like uh, stereotypes, uh, that's what people often will remember. Um, so I think it's important that we shift the way we frame this conversation um, in general towards thinking about, you know, uh, what, what are the challenges that are faced? What are the barriers? What are the inequalities that we can actually see and measure? And, you know, kind of just scooting right around that. I can, I, I you know, we could talk forever about why that myth exists, but the, but the way to get rid of it is really to kind of, I think, um, sort of sidestep talking about it more and more and, and starting to, to look at the data. I'm, I'll, I'll say, I think um, a big problem is the media. Uh, when Caitlyn Jenner is presented as the most famous trans person in America, that is that is not giving an accurate representation of the trans experience for most people. Uh, when the gay couples you see on sitcoms are white people living in obscene wealth, like on Will and Grace and Modern Family, that gives people this idea that 
that's how gay people live. And I think we need more shows like Pose, which unfortunately is ending this season, which actually shows trans people of color scraping by to survive. Uh, you don't you don't see that on TV a lot. I mean, and TV is biased towards the wealthy in lots of ways. But with same sex couples, it's pretty much always a fabulous apartment, fabulous clothes, living lives of decadence. And that's just not the reality for most people in the community. Uh, all right. Another question is, uh, how do we increase Black, Indigenous, pe and people of color transgender representation in executive positions throughout the finan financial institutions? Uh, do you think this type of diversity and inclusion will alleviate some of the obstacles faced by LGBTQIA borrowers? I would say um, definitely that just Putting them in these positions can help, but it's still there's still such rooted systems in place that keep the transgender community oppressed. So having more people and having more hires can help, but it's still we need a new system because we don't live by the regular rules that cisgender or even LGB um, cisgender people actually live by. So helping us create a new system will actually alleviate some of those obstacles faced, like having more understanding and compassion and not judging them if they have a gig economy and unstable income. Yeah, I just, I, I'm sorry to, uh, I just wanted to also note there, um, the financial services industry is, it's frequently been, been a, a research about their diversity and inclusion practices. There is uh, every three years or so, the GAO does a study at the behest of Maxine Waters looking at financial services industry diversity, but they are currently only looking at race and gender. Um, so one place to start would be, you know, if Maxine Waters is going to is going to ask for that study again, which I think she's done it, I think there are like four or five of them out there, to be honest with you. Um, you know, it might be a good time to start, uh, uh, you know, asking for them to include, uh, you know, sexual orientation as well and transgender status in their questions as well. Yeah, I think, uh, sorry, I was going to just jump in. I think Jason's point is a really uh, good one. Um, I mean, I think we're, we're sort of like, adding another realm of, uh, of, of the economy where there's potential discrimination, not just in, in, in credit. But um, um, I think the majority of the big companies that are followed, say, by the Human Rights Campaign and their Corporate Equality Index ask their employees in some way, shape, form about their sexual orientation and gender identity. However, I have yet to actually see any of them <laughs> kind of either uh, do a clear analysis of that, that, they, that they're willing to talk about, number one, or uh, allow uh, researchers to, to use their data to kind of look at, um, at how, uh, at whether, have, whether policies are making a difference in terms of hiring and promoting and retaining uh, LGBT people. Um, whether or not having them in those positions makes a difference, you know, farther down the line in their businesses in terms of who's who's getting um, who's getting loans. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of kinds of questions there that we should be pushing, and, and I love that idea of getting the the GAO and, and Congress to kind of push financial services uh, to uh, to add these questions. Let me just also say that I do I do think there's a growing recognition. Uh, a growing recognition again in the federal government that these questions about data and LGBT people are really important um, in many different kinds of levels. And so whenever we have the opportunity to kind of push them and say, here's where that data would really matter. Here's where it would really help us to know these, the, uh, the composition, not just of the customers, but of the people who are employees. And we can put those things together. That would be very helpful. That's a good reason why uh, these statistical agencies should take action. And they listen for those kinds of questions and for that kind of pressure. All right, well, it's unfortunately, it's time for us to wrap up. Um, we're gonna have closing statements from each of the speakers uh, in the order in which they initially spoke. So we'll be starting off with you, Professor Badgen. Okay, great. Well, this was really fascinating, um, all the different levels and thinking both uh, within the United States and, and not. And I guess um, I, I would just say that um, that I'm very encouraged about the, the um, interest in data. Um, and I hope that we can also extend this conversation to thinking about data and other sorts of realms, thinking about Juan Carlos's uh, discussion about other countries, 
um, and say microfinance institutions, because there are, I've been starting to work on uh, economic employment opportunities for people and in developing countries, having access to microloans is very important. The problem is that LGBTI people often don't have families who can co-sign for them. Um, and so the, uh, there are sort of all sorts of um, structural barriers as well as kind of more social and cultural barriers that are, gonna, um, that are going to make a difference. So I think, you know, we have, we have a lot of research ahead of us to try to figure out, you know, where these barriers exist and then what we can do about them. So it's great to start this conversation. Thanks. Thank you very much. This has been a really very interesting panel. I have also learned a lot and I'm very interested in following and looking at all the documents that have been shared. Uh, and I'll be very happy to continue the conversation. I think there's a lot that we need to talk more about. Uh, several topics that we have raised already in terms of the importance of uh, improving data collection, but also acting on data. And I think the role of the government authorities also in terms of pushing for more uh, data analytics, uh, data gathering, data collection, and, and data usage. So I think there's much more to talk about. I think I agree uh, there's a, an, up, an uphill climb, uh, but I think there are some initial initiatives that uh, have started and could be you know, strengthened. So, and even having this conversation right now as part of this panel, I think it's an important moment and we should build on this. And thanks again. And happy to also have the World Bank as part of a, an important actor to continue the conversation. Thanks a lot. Once again, I would like to reiterate that transgender, the transgender community, especially for transgender people of color, we are not numbers, we are actually people, and we are trying our best and hardest to thrive within this society. But having the opportunities are very limited and discriminative for um, our community. So I really want y'all to understand that to help create at least a new system in order to um, be flexible and provide more help for the transgender community to be able to participate in normal activities of life of which we just want to do. Thank you. And thank you for having me. And I'm hoping that we can uh, dive into this topic a lot more this year and follow up with more research. I'd like to see a, a much deeper um, analysis of the data, um, especially now that we're about to have the 2020 mortgage data come out. So we'll have three years of the enhanced data with more information on loan pricing and other things that can really help expand this. And um, you know, I ideally at some point in time, we would be able to add SOGI data to the Humda data set as well. And I, and, uh, I, I think that would provide even more value. Thank you very much. Sir. All right, well, thanks so much to our wonderful speakers. This has been a fascinating discussion. I wish it could go longer. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd, all, I'd like to also give a special thanks to three people who were very helpful in organizing the panel. Uh, Spencer Watson from CLEAR, which stands for the Center for LGBTQ Economic Advancement and Research, and Robert Chase and Anne-Sophie Jesperson from the World Bank. Uh, so if, you have, if anyone has any questions about this panel or the community of practice, uh, Karen put her email address in the chat and my email address. And uh, stay tuned for Pride Month, where we're uh, where we're going to be celebrating NCRC, and we will have an an event in store. Bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>